the pastor was in the middle of his sermon when he noticed a guy had fallen asleep and his head was on his wife's shoulder. He said, wake up your husband. And she said, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> I've been, I have nodded off during some long sermons. <laughs> and I kind of snorted. My wife said, you're sleeping. Yeah, we've had some pastors that preach an hour and a half. I used to preach 45 minutes, but it seems like I'm down to around 30 minutes or less anymore. I don't, do, I don't do that on purpose. I just used to have a lot of stories, and I ran out of stories. So that's why <laughs> I need some... Uh, I need to get some new stories. Matthew 11, 27 to 28, says this. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Verse 28, come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Dear Lord, we thank you for the rest that we can anticipate. We thank you, Lord, that we as believers know that we're gonna know that we're gonna see you and and to be in in the home with you one day, Lord. And our hearts are burdened with those who are not, Lord, who are not able, who are bidden to come unto you, but will not. And so our hearts are burdened with them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 30, it says this, When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Uh, as you know from Ezra and Nehemiah, this was happening when uh, Cyrus allowed the, uh, the remnant of the captivity of the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem. And Ezra went back because he was burdened to, he was the priest, he was burdened to rebuild uh, the temple. And, and Nehemiah went back as a governor and he was burned to rebuild the wall which was in shambles. It was torn down by Nebuchadnezzar and the gates were burned and he was burdened to restore the gates and Ezra was burdened to restore the temple. But they were standing on the wall. As they, as they dedicated the wall being rebuilt, they were standing on the wall, and that's where this uh, comes from in Nehemiah chapter 12. The priests and Levites first purified themselves, then they purified the people, and then the gates and the wall. So when we think about first the people, you know, um, in Genesis 1:27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Adam and Eve were, the, were perfect when God created them. They were perfect. They were pure. They didn't need to be purified. These people had to be purified because sin had come into the world. Because Adam and Eve then, they sinned. They succumbed to the wiles of the devil, of the evil one, and sin entered the world. And mankind lost their purity. They could no longer walk with God in their sinful state as they had before. Adam and Eve's willful disobedience separated them from God. They no longer had the close fellowship they had with him when uh, that they had before. So they hid from him in the garden. They hid. They knew they were naked, it says. A tragedy was on the way. One son killed another. Family tragedies. Murder came into the world. Sin has ruled the unrepentant mankind ever since. We're still living under that curse. So mankind has become increasingly wicked. 
entire cultures have been opposed to God, opposed to Jehovah, our holy creator God. Instead of worshiping the one true God, they worshiped gods that were not gods. They worshiped images made out of wood and stone. What the images represented were demons, agents of Satan and the enemies of God. And the way they worshiped them was horrible and ungodly. Baal worship involved burning live infants to death in a fire. Chemosh, the god of the Moabites and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, the same kind of worship. They were burning their children alive. Hence, uh, human sacrifices were, uh, human victims were sacrificed in order to appease the anger, uh, and this is Molech, his anger in a time of plague and other trouble, the victim usually being the firstborn son of the sacrificer, the fir not firstborn son, firstborn, and being burnt alive. In the Old Testament, this is referred to as passing through the fire. And, you know, when, when the people originally came out of Egypt and went into those lands, God warned them not to interact with the people around them because they would be tempted to worship their gods as they did. And that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. In Jeremiah 32, 35, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Chemosh seems to have had a taste for blood too. In 2 Kings 3.27, there's human sacrifice going on as part of the rites of Chemosh. They were just demons, and it could be the same demon. It could be the same one that, that these people were sacrificing. Their own children in a horrible way, too. In 2 Kings 3, 26, 27, this is when the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they failed. Verse 27, then he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. The fury against Israel was great, and they withdrew, returned to their own land. And then considered, cons uh, considered the moon goddess, Asherah, was a female goddess, and wherever there was a um, high place, they called them, or shrine for Baal, there was usually an associated shrine for Asherah, who was known as Astarte. There were different names in different cultures. But she was presented as a consort of Baal. And she was also worshipped as a goddess of love and war. Um, and she was sometimes linked with Anath, another Canaanite goddess. The worship of Asherah uh, was noted for its sensuality and involved ritual prostitution. They had male and female prostitutes in these uh, shrines to Asherah. And, they, and, and the priests and priestesses of Asherah also practice divination and fortune telling. All of these practices enraged God. He allowed them to be taken into captivity by the Assyrian Empire, that was the Northern Ten Tribes, because they were the ones that were dabbling in this stuff. And later Jerusalem started doing the same thing, and they were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. All because they refused to obey God. He told them to stay away from that stuff, and they wouldn't do it. Because of idolatry, 
involving sacrificing babies and ritual perversion. Purification was needed. They rebuilt the wall, they rebuilt the temple, and they had to be purified. We would call it sanctification. If they're not purified, well, Cyrus had allowed the, the, what was left of the remnants of the captives to allow them to, go re, to return to Jerusalem. This was 70 years after they were captured. And then we see in Ezra chapter 9 that those who had returned had fallen into sin. It didn't take long. They had engaged in the practices of the people around them, which they were specifically forbidden by God not to do. So they needed to be purified. So a great repentance took place. They separated themselves from the sinful things they had they had gotten into and at this dedication of the newly built wall of Jerusalem the priests and Levites first purified themselves and then they purified the people there were specific um, practices for, for purification most likely involving sprinkling what they called the water of purification you can find that probably in Leviticus but this water of purification they splashed it on themselves and they splashed it on the people and that was a that was a symbol of purification but they had repented and put off the things that they were doing then they purified the gates and then the wall so they dedicated the newly built wall of the city. When they went there, the wall was in shambles. It was knocked down, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's armies. And it was a pile of rubble. And they worked hard. And they, despite the fact that they had enemies all around that they were afraid were going to attack them. And, some, and sometimes they worked with one hand and had a sword in the other hand. You can find that in the Bible. But they dedicated this newly built wall of the city and they had a great celebration. They also purified the wall and the gates. So what does that, all this have to do with us? Well, we're still sinners. We're as guilty as they were. Maybe we're not doing the same things. Hopefully we're not doing the same things. Or as a culture, maybe we are. Killing babies, we don't wait for them to be born. This culture does that. And they celebrate perversion, calling it inclusion. And the latest one is this gender business, this pronoun business. God created the male and female, and that's what they are. So the culture, I mean, we're all sinners except the ones that have emerged from it. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one alive on the planet, nor has there ever been, that was without sin except Jesus himself. So we need to be purified just as they did, so that we can approach God, so that we can move in with him one day. We're going to get to move in with God, Johnny. We're going to get to move in with God. Without purity, without holiness, we will not see him. So there are parallels. The priest and the Levites did the purifying. We don't have a need for priests and Levites anymore. Jesus is our high priest. A priest is an intermediary, an intercessor. When Jesus gave up his life on the cross, and he cried out, it is finished, an earthquake came and the, 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 the curtain that separated the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, was torn from top to bottom. And that was a separation of the presence of God and only the high priest could go in there once a year. He couldn't go in there without blood. And if he had sin, then he would die in there and they tied a rope around his ankle so they could drag him out from under the curtain. 
but we don't need that anymore. The curtain came down. The presence of God, we can access His presence. We don't have to go into that place anymore. It's not necessary. We don't have to go through a priest or through rituals anymore. Jesus is our intermediary. John 14, 16, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way to get to the Father except through Jesus. The wall, the wall was a separator. It was a divider. It was, it was to keep the enemies out of the city and keep the, the people that belonged in the city to keep them together in safety in there. Some things um, of one sort or another, um, separators and dividers, the ancient cities all had walls. Their function was to keep enemies out, barriers against those who would cause harm. So of one kind or another, there were barriers, one sort of another. But how could a wall be impure? If they had to purify the wall, then it was impure. Maybe they thought that the wall wouldn't function well unless they dedicated it to God. But they did think that it was in need of purifying. So how can a wall be pure? Well, if water is pure, there's pure water and impure water, uh, it's free of contaminants, right? Um, it's safe to consume. If oil is pure, then it'll burn brightly. Con oil with contaminants that's not filtered and pure doesn't have its effectiveness. So purity then is maximum effectiveness. The purpose of the wall was to keep impurities out. In other words, keep the enemies out to keep them away because they were threatening to keep the contamination of the unclean from contaminating the clean. That was the purpose. And the gates of the city were places where they could come and go. Because if there was just a wall with no gates, then you couldn't get in or out if you had to. So those were the places where they could come and go, the people that lived in the city. So there were doors and bars put in place so as to close those doors when enemies approached. The gates functioned as a control over what was trying to come in. The wall is unmovable, but the gate can be moved. So how is, the, how is it that the gate had to be purified? The gates then were thought to be in need of purifying, so they would work perfectly. So they would keep the enemies out, and so you could open the bars if you needed to go out. And they were the work of human hands. They were made out of wood. But there would be flaws. There would be weaknesses. So a gate was thought to be in need of purifying, so they would work perfectly. The gates were the work of human hands. A pure gate would be one that is strong to keep evil out. The gates would be places of openness or weakness along the wall. It would be easier for the enemy to break through wood than a stone wall. So the defenders could put extra um, defenses where the gates were because that's where the enemy would try to penetrate. So dedicating the gates to God in a purification uh, right would seem to enlist the help of God in keeping the enemies of the city away. There were hostile people all around. They didn't want to see the wall built. So there's parallels with us today. We're all sinners. Some are saved, some are not. A 
unrepentant sinners are on the wrong side of God, of God's wall. They are separated from God. We've all been there. God's wall is perfect. It can't be penetrated. It can't be climbed over. It can't be tunneled under. Outside of the wall is the world. The world system, the world with all of its evil. Those outside the wall are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Those that are inside the wall, on God's side of the wall, are on the narrow road that leads to eternal life. We are on the Jesus way. Few there be, the Bible says, that find it. To get through the wall, we have to go through a pure gate. Jesus is the gate. He's the pure gate. No other gate will do. You can't get through that wall of separation that we have from God without going through the Jesus gate himself. John 10, 7 and 9. Therefore Jesus said again, Verily, ver verily I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. <clears throat> Whoever enters through me will be saved. He'll come in and go out and find pasture. The only way to get on God's side of the wall of separation that happened when Adam and Eve sinned is through the gate that is Jesus. We all start outside of that wall. Many come up to the gate and decide not to go through it. They come up there and they say, meh. It's a tragedy. They reject the Savior. <clears throat> they are lost. They don't have to be lost. God doesn't want them to be lost. It's not his that any should not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. They just refuse to believe. We live in a culture that refuses to believe. The culture refuses to believe. They push God out. Uh, he's pushed out of the culture. But how blessed we are. We have come through the gate. We're on God's side of the wall. Those on the world's side are bound for destruction. The world's on a collision course with God because of evil. Friendship with, with the world is enmity with God, the Bible says. Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The world isn't going to last, but God is. Heaven is. New Jerusalem is. New, the new world. This world isn't going to last. Ezra and Nehemiah were surrounded by enemies. Ezra the priest rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah the governor rebuilt the wall. The enemies would be kept at bay. They would be kept out until the time of the Romans. Come unto me is the invitation. That means the gate is open. Come on in. Come on in to the inside where God is. We all have, you know, I'm looking across here and I know all of you. And then that you're all born again believers and that you've all come through the gate that is Jesus and, and that you're all on God's side. But I'm wondering today about our unsaved loved ones. If you have unsaved loved ones today, come on down here. Let's just pray for unsaved loved ones today. We all have them. So if you have some, come on down here. Come on down. Let's make a line across here.